أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين والخاتم النبيين بالقاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله أما بعد فقد قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في القرآن الكريم وقوله الحق وهو أصدق الصادقين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات لهم جنات النعيم صدق الله العلي العظيم صلى الله عليه محمد وآل محمد اللهم صل على محمد Dear brothers and sisters in Islam, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I begin in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the most beneficent, the most merciful. And I begin first and foremost, as always, by thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for blessing you and I with this life, for blessing you and I with this existence, for indeed it is due to the infinite mercies, blessings, and bounties of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you and I exist upon the face of this earth. And if it were not for these blessings and bounties that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has endowed you and I with, then surely you and I and this whole universe would cease to function and would cease to exist. And today you and I have gathered to commemorate, without doubt, the commemoration and the shahada of the greatest man to ever walk the face of this earth after the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, none other than Imam Amir al-Mu'min alayhi salam, sallallahu alayhi wa Muhammad wa Muhammad. And when you and I examine the life of Imam Ali السلام, and the legacy he left behind from the battles he fought in, the courage that he showed you and I, the beautiful supplications he has left you and I, the beautiful hadith and the sermons, the letters we have from him, it is indeed a legacy that you and I can take many lessons from. And one of his greatest works that we have from him is none other than the book of Nahj al which in its eloquence after the Qur'an is second to none. And if you look at Nahj al this book is a compilation of the sayings, the sermons, and the hadith of Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam. And when you examine this text, indeed, it is compiled by the great Allama Sharif al radi as we know. And this book contains some of the most eloquent sayings, a hadith, and sermons, and letters that we have from our respected Imam. And in the short, uh, the short time that we have today, one hadith in specific that I wanted to speak about is hadith number 125. If you go into Nahj al and you search for hadith number 125, this hadith is also mentioned in Usul al-Kafi and other texts where the Imam defines Islam for you and I. He gives a definition of Islam. You know, we always wonder, what is Islam? What's the... How can we define Islam in the best way possible? And the Imam in this hadith number 125, he gives us a tremendous six-part definition of Islam. He says, لَأَنْسُبَنَّ الْإِسْلَامَ نِسْبَةً لَمْ يَنْسُبْهَا أَحَدٌ قَبْلٍ That today I will define for you this religion of Islam in a way that no one has ever defined it before me. So he's letting you and I know this definition that he's going to give you and I is truly a profound definition in which he will explain to you and I what this religion of Islam is all about. He says, number one, he gives, he says, لا أنسب الإسلام نسبة لم ينسب أحد قبل الإسلام هو التسليم. He says, number one, the first part of the religion of Islam, the first principle, is that Islam هو التسليم, meaning Islam, the reality of Islam, is submission, submission to the will of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Meaning, if you and I claim to be Muslims. And the first principle is submitting to the will of God and His Messenger, even if it goes against something that you and I might think is right. Because often you find, you know, as Muslims, people, they come forward and say, you know, this law of Islam doesn't make sense to my intellect, so I'm not going to follow it. Or this law of Islam, you know, it's too expensive. For example, homes, too much money, so I'm not going to give that. A lot of examples as such, we've cited, we like to pick and choose, but Allah says in the first verse of Surah Al-Hujurat, where he gives you and I moral commandments, right? Surah Al-Hujra, the surah that contains moral commandments for you and I to follow. Allah says the first verse he begins with is what? Ya ayyuhal ladina amen, la tuqaddimu bayna yadayi allahi wa rasulihi wa attaqullah. In Allah is Samir Alim. That all you who believe, do not go ahead of Allah and His Messenger. Meaning, do not put your opinions, your beliefs, and your thoughts above those of God and His Messenger. Because really, if you look at it, the meaning of a true Muslim 
is that when you and I are at our crossroads, meaning my intellect or my family or my thoughts and my <coughs> desires want me to do one certain thing, but God and His Messenger have told me to do something else, I'm only a true Muslim when I pick what God and His Messenger have told me to do above even myself. That's why if you look in history and you examine and you go and you read incidents of the, the life of the Prophet, and when he was beginning to spread the religion of Islam, many people, they tried to make compromises with the Prophet. They tried to say, the Prophet will pick certain things to do, and will leave other things, but we still want to be Muslim for the, for the political benefits. You know, it's a new up-and-coming thing, so we'll become Muslim for that, but we want to pick and choose what we like about this religion. For example, an, uh, an example of this is a man by the name of Tamib ibn Jarasha. He came from his tribe of Thaqif, they came to Medina, and they had agreed to become Muslims under certain conditions. So they came and they were referred to Imam Ali السلام, on how um, to proceed um, converting to Islam. So they went to Imam Ali, they said, we've agreed to become Muslims, and these are our conditions, and we're ready to accept Islam. So the Imam says, let me hear your con conditions one more time. What are the conditions that you're going to accept Islam under? They said, we have, it. We have three conditions, the tribe of Fatif, We'll accept Islam under three conditions. Number one, we want to commit, we want to continue to take interest. Number two, we want to continue to commit adultery. And number three, we don't want to pray salah. These are the three conditions. You accept these three conditions, and it will become Muslims. We're with you. So the Imam says, you know, I can't accept these conditions. And eventually they refer to the Prophet. And the Prophet didn't accept these conditions either. Why? Because they're emphasizing that if you claim to be a Muslim, don't expect to come into the religion of Islam just for political or economic benefits, anything of that nature. No. The first principle in the religion of Islam that you accept, have to accept first and foremost, if you claim to be a Muslim, is that number one, you have to submit to the will of Allah and His Messenger. And you know these Arabs, they try to do this all the time. They used to come to the Prophet, we'll become Muslim, but we want to still worship our idol of Lat. We want to still worship Uzza. We want to take one day worshiping God, one day worshiping our idols. But the Prophet never accepted such things because Allah says in the Quran, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يَكْفُرُونَ بِاللَّهِ وَرُسُلِهِ وَيُرِيدُونَ أَن يُفَرِّقُوا بَيْنَ اللَّهِ وَرُسُلِهِ وَيَقُولُونَ نُؤْمِنُ بِبَعْضٍ وَنَكْفُرُ بِبَعْضٍ أُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْكَافِرُونَ حَقَّ وَاعْتَدْنَا لِلْكَافِرِينَ أَذَابٌ مُحِينَ that those individuals who try to differentiate between God and His Messenger, and they say, We'll believe in some of it, and we won't believe in some of the others. These people, that these are the true disbelievers, because Allah is emphasizing that there's no picking and choosing in the religion of Islam. This doesn't exist. If you claim to be a Muslim, then you must submit your will to the will of Allah and His Messenger. And that's something that's constantly emphasized in the religion of Islam. And you know, it's not just lip service submission. Sometimes we think, you know, I said my shahada, Ashhadu la ilaha illallah, la ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, so I submit it. But there's different levels of submission. And the great scholar, Shaheed Mutahari, he explains that there's three basic levels of submission. He says the first submission is the submission, what they call a submission of the body. Right, for example, let's say two individuals are fighting and one individual beats the other person. The person that has lost submits with his body. Doesn't mean he still likes that other person. Doesn't mean he agrees his, with his, his opinions to agree with that other person. Simply he submitted with the body because he lost the battle. That's submission of the body. Then you have number two, submission of the intellect. Two individuals argue, one, indi one individual's arguments are better, so he wins the argument. But that doesn't mean the other person is convinced about the arguments of the other person. He just agrees and he acquiesces that I lost the argument and thus I accept, I submit. But the third and the highest level is the submission of the heart. When there's submission of the mind, the body, and the heart all together and they're all in unison. That so you submit with your whole being to what is being stated. That's true submission. For example, if you look in the Quran, right? Shaitan, we know Shaitan, Iblis, right? The most accursed creature of Allah who Allah expelled from his kingdom who was arrogant, shaitan had the first two levels of submission. Because if you read the Quran and you know the hadith, shaitan had these first two levels. He submitted with the body. We know as Iblis, he worshipped God for hundreds of years. He worshipped God. So clearly he had submission of the body. He also had submission of the intellect. Because if you look in the Quran, when Allah narrates how Iblis disobeyed him, Allah says that Iblis did, qala, that I, by your authority, Allah, I will misguide them all. So number one, Iblis also has submission of the intellect. 
Because he recognized that Allah has all power. He says, بِعِزَّتِكَ لَأُغْوِيَنَّهُ مَجْمَعِينَ إِلَّا عِبَادَكَ مِنْهُمُ الْمُخْلَسِينَ Except those who you have chosen as your servants. So he recognizes that he understands, his intellect recognizes that God is his creator. His intellect recognizes that the Imams and the Prophets are those individuals who are infallible. So he has submission of the intellect. But what he was missing was the submission of the body. And without that submission of the body, he was expelled from the kingdom of Allah's mercy. Meaning Allah is telling you and I, an individual that has true submission, has true submission to the truth. Because Islam is a religion of the truth. You have to submit to truth in every aspect of life. And one who claims to be a Muslim, he should not have the trait of what they call juhud. What is juhud? Juhud is the trait of denial. An individual who though he knows something is right for his personal benefits or family benefits or ulterior motives, doesn't accept the truth. You know an example they give to understand what's a Muslim versus someone who has the trait of juhud is they say, imagine there are two doctors, right? One is a, a recent graduate, just a new doctor, and one is the most experienced doctor in the field, the most well-renowned well -renowned physician in the world. And they have two differing opinions. The renowned doctor says, you know, this is the right way to do something. And the young physician says, you know, I think this is the right way to do something. And they do research and eventually, the experienced doctor realizes, you know, the young physician is right, I'm wrong. Now, if this doctor does not accept the stance of this young physician because he says, I'm more experienced, I'm not going to acquiesce to him, then he has the trait of juhud, denial, because he refused to submit to what is the truth in that circumstance. So a Muslim in all aspects of life is a son who submits to the truth and full stop, no ifs and buts. Now I was talking all of this about submission. You know, you might think, well, how different in Islam than, for example, Christianity then? You're just saying submit, submit to the truth. You know, in Christianity they say submit to Jesus, Jesus is the Son of God, Jesus will love you, just submit. Then how, how is Islam different if you're just saying all you have to do is submit to the will of God and His Messenger? But you see, Imam Ali Islam, in the second part of the hadith, he continues, he builds upon this. The first thing he said is, Al-Islam huwa taslim. That the first thing, the essence of the religion of Islam, the reality of the religion of Islam is submission. What taslim huwa yaqeen. The reality of submission, the Imam says, is certainty. Meaning, in order for you to reach a state of submission, you first have to be certain of your beliefs, right? For example, you know in Islam, we have what we call the usul al din which are the roots of our religion, and the furu al din the branches of our religion. In Islam, when it comes to the usul al din these branches, the foundation of our religion, you question as much as you want, have as many doubts as you want. Think about it rationally, philosophically, and Allah constantly encourages in the Quran. He says, do you not reflect? Do you not reflect? Do you not think? Do you not have understanding? And this is encouraged. As much as you want, argue, try to find the truth, be convinced about these usul al-deen. Gain that conviction. But once you've established and you've gained belief and you have conviction in the usul al-deen, you've established the foundations, now Allah says that once you've accepted tawheed, once you've accepted nabuwa, once you've accepted imama, once you've accepted qiyama, once you've accepted tawheed, nabuwa, imama, adala, qiyama, once you've accepted all of these five, now you have to submit. Because you've already, if you're truly convinced about these first five, then you've already agreed that God, I know you're more knowledgeable than me. I know the Prophet is more knowledgeable than me. Then submission becomes an automatic result because you realize, if I'm convinced that God is knowledgeable than me, God knows me better than I know myself, then it's easy to, to submit to him and it's easy to submit to the will of the messenger because I've already been convinced that these things are the right things to do. And just as in with submission, there are different levels. Even in yaqeen, in certainty, they give three basic levels of certainty. Three types of yaqeen. They say number one, the first type of yaqeen is what they call ilmul yaqeen, knowledge of certainty. Then they have aynul yaqeen, eye of certainty, and haqqul yaqeen, the heart of certainty. Now you might say, what do these mean? So the example that you give to try to understand, you know, the difference between these three types of certainty is they say, imagine there's a fire. Okay, imagine you're in a forest, you're really far away, and you see a lot of smoke coming up. So you understand there's a fire. You have what they call Ayn al yaqeen the most basic level. I see fire, I mean, I see smoke from the fire, so I know there's a fire because of the smoke. So I have knowledge, certainty with knowledge. Then you walk closer towards the fire, you continue to walk closer, and then you begin to see the fire. So now you have Ayn al yaqeen now you've seen the fire with your eyes, your certainty meets your eyes. Then when you actually go and you stand near the fire and you feel its heat 
and you put your hand down and you burn, you get burned by the fire, now you have haqqul yaqeen. Now you are truly convinced with your essence that this fire is real and it exists. So similarly, in Islam, with terms of logic and understanding, you've got your rational proofs, right? The ones, ilmul yaqeen, that give you the understanding of your, in your intellect. You've got the ilmul yaqeen, you see the attributes of Allah throughout this universe, you see the blessings of Allah. If we're to use the metaphor of the footprints of Allah in all of His creation, you've got that ilmul yaqeen. Then the haqqul yaqeen is when you've reached certainty with your whole being, that you constantly feel the presence of God no matter what situation you're in. The presence of God completes certainty. And I speak for myself first, that we surely have not reached the stage. Because if we had truly re reached the stage of haqqul yaqeen, being completely certain, that we wouldn't find it hard to believe in the things that God says in the Qur'an. If we were truly convinced that the Qur'an is the word of God, and that the word of God is the truth. For example, because Allah says in the Qur'an, for example, just to give an example of one thing, for example, giving donations, right? Giving charity in the way of Allah. Allah says, Who amongst you will give charity in the way of Allah, a goodly loan in the way of Allah, so He will double it for you, and for you will be a great reward. Now if you and I were truly convinced that the, God, the word of God is the truth, then you and I might think, well God is promising, if you give donations in my way, I will double it for you and you will have a great reward. We wouldn't have any hesitation giving donations. We wouldn't have any hesitation giving money for the cause of Allah because we understand God is promising that if you give in my way, I will double it for you. But that conviction isn't there, so there's still hesitation when it comes to giving donations for the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's still hesitation because we have not reached what they call that haqqul yaqeen. Even in our belief system, in the traditions that we do, for example, the reciting of dua, the praying the way we pray, the women wearing the hijab, the men keeping the beard, all of these things part of our religion, you find many people, unfortunately, they are not convinced about these things that they do. They're doing them as a tradition, just because their parents did it this way, just because the community does it this way. They're not convinced. And you know an amazing example of this is a scientific experiment that was one conducted. They did a scientific experiment on monkeys, okay, monkeys. And they put, imagine, they did the scientific experiment, they put five monkeys in a cage. So imagine, there's a scientist, he puts five monkeys in a cage, and he puts bananas at the top of the cage. So he leaves his monkeys with these bananas at the top, and he puts them in a cage. Now, of course, the monkeys right away, what are they going to do? They're going to go for the bananas. So there's a ladder there that lets them go to the bananas, and he leaves them to be. Puts the five monkeys in, first monkey sees the bananas, he tries to go up to the bananas. As soon as they get to the ladder, what the scientist does, he sprays them with cold water. So the monkey goes back down. They keep trying, but every time they go on the ladder to try to get the bananas, they get sprayed by cold water. Second monkey tries, third monkey tries, fourth monkey tries, fifth monkey tries. Every time they try to get the bananas, they got sprayed by cold water. So eventually they're like, you know what, we had enough. We don't, we don't want the bananas. So all the monkeys just stay at the bottom, and they just look at the bananas, and they live their life, right? They continue, we don't want the bananas anymore. So then what the scientist did was interesting. He took out one of these monkeys that had been sprayed by the cold water, and he put in a new monkey. A one monkey that has not been sprayed by the cold water. He doesn't know what's going on. So they put, now there's five monkeys inside this cage. Four have been sprayed by water. One is new, doesn't know what's going on. So he sees these bananas at the top. And he sees the other monkeys are not going for the bananas. So he says, you know what, I'm going to go for the bananas. Why is no one else going for the bananas? So the monkey goes to the ladder. As soon as the monkey goes to the ladder, the other four monkeys, they beat the monkey up. They beat the monkey up, they begin to beat him, and the monkey doesn't know what's going on. All he knows is, okay, no bananas for me, no ladder. So now all five monkeys are sitting there. So the scientists continue this process. Now they remove another monkey from the original monkeys that had been sprayed with the water. So now there's three monkeys that have been sprayed by water, one that has been beaten, and one is fresh, doesn't know anything. So they leave them in the cage. Now this new monkey again looks around, why is no one going for the bananas? He goes for the bananas. Interestingly enough, all four monkeys begin to beat this monkey. Even the one that has not experienced the cold water. He just knows, I was beaten and now we're all beating, so now they're all going to go beat the monkey. They continue this process, they continue this process until you've got only five new monkeys. None of them have experienced the cold water. None of them. Only they've experienced beating and now one new monkey is, is entered into the cage. You've got four monkeys that have been beaten. They don't know why they're beating each other up for the monkeys. They don't know why they're staying away from the bananas. All they know is we're beating people up. No one goes into the bananas. So this new monkey comes in, looks around. 
goes for the bananas. Interestingly enough, all four monkeys, for no reason, they go and start to beat this monkey up. And you know, if you were to take a step back, and if these monkeys could talk, you would ask them, okay, hold on a second, what's going on here? Why are you guys beating each other up? Why is no one going for the bananas? You know, perhaps they would say, this is just the way we do things. I don't know, this is our tradition. All we do is anyone tries to go to the ladder, we just beat them up. None of them even experienced the cold water. But they have somehow magically continued this tradition of just following what everyone else around them is doing. And as sad as it is to say, you and I as a human race and as Muslims are very much similar. That if you were to go into a mosque, you're going to see people doing things like dua, prayer. There are certain beliefs and you're to ask them, why do you believe in this? They would say, well, my community does it this way. I don't really know. My, this is what my father said. I don't know why I'm doing this. We're sort of in that same boat because we don't have that conviction. That conviction, we need to up our levels of conviction the way Imam Ali Salam had that. That once, a companion of Imam Ali by the name of Di'bin, he comes to the Imam and he says, Hal ya Have you seen your Lord, O oh, Imam? Have you seen your Lord? The Imam looks at him and he says, ma la ara? Do I worship something that I don't see? So then he says, Wa kayfa tara? How do you see him? He says, La tarahu that they don't worship him, but that they don't, I don't see my Lord with the physical eyes that I have. Rather, I see him with the reality of faith, the eyes of the heart. That's how I see and feel the presence of God. That's that level of certainty that you and I need to try to get towards. So the Imam is saying, taking a step back, getting back on track where we left off, that Islam went to see, the Imam said. First principle in Islam, submission. The reality of submission, what, what, what taslim huwa yaqeen. Then he continues, wal yaqeen huwa tasdeeq. The reality of certainty is affirmation. Once you've been convinced in your religion, once you've submitted to the will of Allah, now you've affirmed your belief. Your belief is set in stone. No more doubts. Certainty is there, submission is there. So now you've reached affirmation. Then he says, what tasdeeq huwa iqra. Once you reach the level of affirmation, the reality of affirmation is what? Acknowledging the blessings of God and the existence of God Himself. Acknowledging all that God has given you. That you know, if you and I really are to take a step back, you know sometimes in life, we're sort of in what they call the rat race, right? Every day, same busy schedule, get up for school, get up for work, go to work, come home, eat dinner, go to sleep. It's sort of like a cycle and we have no moment to like, take a pause and take a step back and realize all the blessings that you and I are surrounded with. And Allah in the Qur'an, He constantly emphasizes this. He says, for example, إِنَّ فِي خَلْقِ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَاخْتِلَافِ اللَّيْلِ وَالنَّهَارِ لَآيَاتٍ لِأُولِ الْأَلْبَابِ That surely in the creation of the heavens and the earth, the alternation of the day and night, there are signs for people who have understanding. الَّذِينَ يَذْكُرُونَ اللَّهَ قِيَامًا وَقُعُودًا وَعَلَى جُنُوبِهِمْ وَيَتَفَكَّرُونَ فِي خَلْقِ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ رَبَّنَا مَا خَلَقْتَ هَذَا بَاطِلًا سُبْحَانَكَ فَكِنَا عَذَابَ النَّارِ Allah is describing what believers do. Allah is saying, these believers, they remember God standing, sitting on their sides. They ponder upon the creation of the heavens and the earth, and they reflect to themselves, My Lord, surely you have not created all of this in vain. As in surely all of this has some purpose. Praise be to you, and save us from the hellfire. And so many verses like this in the Qur'an. For example, Surah Al-Mulk, Allah asks us to go outside, look at the skies, look at the magnificent creation of the God. of God. Allah says, go outside, look at the creation of the heavens and the earth, the way they're perfectly lined up. Go look, do you see any incongruity in God's creation? No, you don't. Then he says, go look again. Go look again, and you will keep looking until you will be dazzled and mesmerized by the creation of God and its beauty. So many verses like this in the Quran, even another one, Allah says, Inna fi samawati wal ardi, wa nahari. وَالْفُلْكِ الَّتِي تَجْرِي فِي الْبَحْرِ بِمَا يَنْفَعُ النَّاسِ وَمَا أَنْزَلَ اللَّهُ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ مِنْ مَاءٍ فَأَحْيَا بِهِ الْأَرْضَ بَعْدَ مَوْتِهَا وَبَثَّ فِيهَا مِنْ كُلِّ دَابَّةٍ وَتَصْرِيفُ الرِّيَاحَ وَالسَّحَابَ الْمُسَخَّرِ بَيْنَ السَّمَاءِ وَالْأَرْضِ لَآيَاتٍ لِقَوْمٍ يَعْقِلُونَ Elegant set of verses, Allah says, Go, do you not see that in the creation of the heavens and the earth, 
alternation of day and night, the, the ships that sail on the sea that you profit from, the rain that God sends down from the sky that gives life to the earth after it's dead, the animals that God has spread throughout, the movement of the winds, the clouds that God has made subservient from you between the heavens and the earth. These are all signs that only ya'kalun. These are all signs for people who think, who have intellect. Allah continuously says, Do you not see all that I have given you? That's why in Surah Rahman, Allah mentions so many times, Which of my bounties will you deny me for? As in, is there something that you wanted, something your existence that you did not even deserve? I even gave you that. That's what Allah says, Ya Yul Insan, Ma gharraka bi Rabbika al Kareem. O mankind, what has led you astray from your great Lord? As in, what is it? Has He not blessed you enough? Has He not given you enough? Has He not provided you with all that you've asked for? As in, this existence is the very greatest gift that you and I could possibly even have. And Allah constantly reminds us of these blessings in the Quran to get us to think about, as in, take a step back. I mean, we sort of, you know, in, especially if you and I live in cities and we work and so on and so forth. We sort of get confused and we sort of forget, as in, why am I here? What am I doing in this life? As in, did God, you know, Allah says in the Quran, أَفَحَسِبْتُمْ أَنَّمَا خَلَقْنَاكُمْ عَبَثًا وَأَنَّكُمْ إِلَيْنَا لَا تُرْجَعُونَ That do they think that we created them without any purpose and that you won't be returned to us? As in, do you think that really this existence has no meaning? It has no purpose that you just come forward, you live a life, you become a baby, you live your life, have fun your teenage years, then get a job, then become a family, then when you're about to die, you become religious. Is this the cycle that you're supposed to, that's supposed to follow? Is this the purpose of the creation that God is saying? Allah is saying, no, there's much more in it. That Allah is saying, you the human being are my greatest creation. You're my representative on the face of this earth. Your potential is to be greater than the angels. But you and I, for some reason, it doesn't register with our brains, that we are a little confused, we become lost, deceived by the world, like living a normal life, we see everyone around us is doing whatever they want, doing however, thinking whatever they want, having new beliefs, one day this is legal, the next day this is not legal, we just follow, we're just going with the trend, no intellect, no thinking, no reflection on the blessings of Allah. So Imam Ali is saying, number four, acknowledge the blessings of God and all that He has given you. Then Imam continues. Now he's getting to the meat of it. Then the Imam continues. Now what's the reality of this? He says, Wal ikrar wal ada. The reality of acknowledgement of God's blessings is deliverance. Now he said, what do you mean deliverance? Then the Imam continues. Wal ada, the final piece of the puzzle. Wal ada wal amal. That deliverance is action. That at the end of the day, all of these definitions that the Imam gives, Islam is submission, submission is certainty. Certainty is affirmation. Affirmation is acknowledgement of God's blessings. Acknowledgement of God's blessings is deliverance. Deliverance, it all boils down to what? Action. Al-Islam huwa al-Aman. The Islam at the end of the day is a religion of action. If there's no action, then there's no use. It's just a title. There's no difference between the Jew, the Christian, the Hindu, the atheist. If there's no action, then there's no benefit. That's why Allah, whenever you look in the Quran and you see Allah describes the believers, He always puts faith and doing of good deeds together. Surely, those who believe and do good deeds, for them is the paradise. Not just who believe. Because faith without action has no value. They say, talk is cheap. You can talk the talk, but can you walk the walk? That's the real question. That, that's really important. Because I can claim to say, I'm a Muslim, I'll be saved, but if it's just on the lips and there's no action, then it means nothing. You know, once a man came to the Prophet by the name of Abdullah ibn Salam. He was a Jewish man and he wanted to convert to the religion of Islam. And he came to the Prophet and he asked him questions. You know, he wanted to inquire about this religion. He wanted to know, is this the right religion? Is he really a Prophet? So he asked him a bunch of questions. And one of the most interesting questions this man asked the Prophet, he says, Is tawjabul jannah bil Islam o bil iman o bi a'malihim? He wants to know what the Prophet thinks. Does one qualify for paradise with being a Muslim, by having faith, or by their actions? It's a good question. As in, what gets me to paradise? Is it just being a Muslim? Is it having true faith? Is it the actions? So he asks him this question. Prophet gives a beautiful response. He says, number one, he says, first, put Islam aside. Islam is just a title. If it's just a title, it doesn't mean anything. The first thing the Prophet says is, 
istawjabu al-jannah bi imanihim that you qualify for paradise with your faith meaning if you have true faith that's a qualification for paradise doesn't mean you'll get in you simply qualify for paradise if you have faith then allah then the holy prophet continues rather he says istawjabu al-jannah bi imanihim wa yadkhuluna bi rahmatillah that they enter paradise with the mercy of God. Because, you know, you and I really deserve a reward when you and, I, you and I have actually done something to deserve the reward. If you and I are doing everything in the universe with all that God has given us, as in our existence itself is from God, how can you expect to deserve something when God is the one who gave you everything to begin with? So you enter paradise with the mercy of God. Then he says the final part, وَيُقْسِمُونَهَا بِعَمَالِهِمْ that they divide up paradise and they determine their levels and stages in paradise by their actions. Not by the fact that they were Muslim, not by the fact that they had faith, but by their actions. That's what Allah says, right? In Surah Al-Mulk, الَّذِي خَلَقَ الْمَوْتَ وَالْحَيَاةَ لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا That surely He created life and death so that He may test you to see which one of you is best in deeds. أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا Allah didn't say quality, quantity. Allah saying quality, best in deeds. Who not who did the most deeds? You know that famous story of Imam Ali Islam that's mentioned in the Quran where he gives his ring in, in ruku to the, the poor man that's begging. Some commentators, they say, you know, this ring was extremely valuable. It was worth so much. And that's why it was so great. We say, no, no, no. What Allah appreciated about the action wasn't necessarily the value of the ring. It was the quality of the action, the intention, and the sincerity behind the action is what made that action valuable. That's why, you know, when I think of Imam Ali salam, on a personal level, when I think of Imam, aside from all the great things that he did, the first thing when the name of Imam Ali comes to my head is I think a man of action. A man who did things, who stepped up to the challenge and he got things done. He didn't just talk about being brave, no. In Uhud, when all the companions of the Prophet, they ran away from him, who was there protecting the Prophet and risking his life to do so? When the Prophet had to escape Mecca to go to Medina, who was the man who stepped up and acted and said, Prophet, I will sleep in your bed and I will risk my life for you? Imam Ali alayhi salam. Who was the one? Did he just talk about feeding the poor, being charitable? No. Imam was that same person who in the middle of the night, despite being an imam, despite being a caliph, would go and he would feed the hungry, would feed the needy with his face covered because he didn't want them to recognize him. This is what I'm talking about when we talk about quality of action. Imam Ali alayhi salam, a man of action. And you know one story that really boggles a bit the mind as to what a great man this person was and how far you and I for, are from the standards and the legacy that he has left behind for us. And that you know, the Imam is, you know, sometimes he used to work for a Jewish man, he used to plant farms, I mean plant, uh, plant palm trees, he used to dig wells. And you know, constantly he would plant these trees, he would dig these wells and then he would donate them to those who needed it, the orphans, the needy, constantly. It was like his hobby. He would work, donate to the poor, do, do, donate to the needy. So one day, one of his companions sees the Imam in the hot suns of Arabia in the middle of the day. The Imam is sweating, he's digging wells, he's planting trees, and he says, the Imam, you know, when are you going to stop doing this? You've done so much already. I said, isn't it enough? And the Imam gives him a beautiful reply. He says, perhaps if I knew my actions were accepted, I would stop. But I don't know if my actions are accepted, so I will never stop. This is the level of certainty. The level of belief that the Imam has reached. That's why when the Imam is saying Al Islam hu al Amal, that Islam is a religion of action, he's backing that up with action, with the performance of good deeds. And that's why you and I value and respect and honor such a person like that. Because it wasn't just talking the talk, but he was an individual who, after the Prophet, defended and promoted and worked for the religion of Islam like no other individual. And on a night like tonight, the 19th of Ramadan, you find that the Imam is at the house of his daughter, right? He's at the house of his daughter to break his fast. And this daughter, interesting enough, she offers him three dishes. They say that his daughter came to him, he was time, for, time to break the fast, and she came to him with some salt, some type of yogurt drink, and some type of hard barley bread. So the Imam looks at all of these things that the daughter has brought forward, and she look, he looks at the daughter, and he says, when have you ever seen your father eat more than two types of things? Take one of these away. So the Imam, the daughter takes away, tries to take away the salt. The Imam says, no, leave the salt, take away this yogurt drink. 
I'll break my fast with salt and barley bread. So he goes and the daughter leaves and he breaks his fast and they say the night progressed and eventually they narrate that Imam was a little restless this night for some reason. He was restless. He began to pace back and forth and he began to recite The Imam began to pace back and forth they say that he came outside the house and he looked towards the sky. He began to recite, Here, here, Wallahi Layla, Alati Wa'adani Biha Rasulullah. Most certainly, this is the night that has been promised to me by the Messenger of Allah. The Imam, as the time for the Fajr prayer approached, they say that he began to walk towards Masjid al-Kufa. They say as he began to walk, there were some birds and ducks that were in the way. They began to flap their wings. They began to block the way of Amir al-Mu'mineen. It's almost as if these birds were saying, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, do not go towards the masjid tonight. Imam Ali salam began to continue towards Masjid al-Kufa. As he approached the masjid, he entered the masjid. He saw some individuals were sleeping. He began to wake them up for the Fajr prayer. Then he walked towards the front of the masjid. He began to recite the Adhan for Fajr. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. He began to recite and he finished the Adhan. Then he walked towards the Mihrab and he began his prayer. He stood in Qiyam, then he went into Ruku, then he went into Sujood. As the Imam was in Sujood, a man by the name of Ibn Muljim began to rush towards the Imam with a poisonous sword. As the Imam began to raise his head from the Sajda, Ibn Muljim struck the blessed head of Amir al Mu'mineen on the head. They say that blood began to gush. The beard of Amir al Mu'mineen was drenched with blood. Imam alayhi salam cried out, Fudtu wa Rabbil Ka'ba. By the Lord of the Ka'ba, I have been successful. They say that a voice was heard. That Archangel Jibra'il cried out, Tahaddamat wallah arkan al huda The pillars of guidance have fallen today. They say soon after his children, Imam al Hassan and Hussein, they rushed towards their father. They began to carry him back towards the house. As they approached the house, the Imam says, Oh my children, I want you to stop carrying me. They said, Why, Father, why should we stop carrying you? He said, I don't want my daughter Zainab to see me in this day. But I tell you, Ya Ali, what would you have done if you saw how your daughter Zainab was treated in Karbala? Inna lillah. Wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. وَسَيَعْلَمُ الَّذِينَ ظَلَمُوا أَيَّ مُنْقَلَبٍ يَنْقَلِبُونَ وَالْآقِبَةُ لِلْمُتَّقِينَ Martin and Hussain. Ya Hussain. Ya Hussain. Ya Hussain. Ya Hussain. Ya Hussain. Ya Hussain.